Hello everyone and welcome to EGP's newest webinar in which we will be exploring with you the role and potential of the arts in peace building. My name is Maria Paula and along with my colleague Teresa, we will be exploring today how art can contribute to peace building. The idea for this webinar came from our experience in peace building projects and how we have seen that conflict transformation needs a lot of creativity. So we've been asking ourselves, what connections are there between artistic expression, emotions, and conflict behavior? Which approaches exist and how do they work? This talk is precisely an attempt to go about these inquiries. And for that purpose, we are very excited to come with the inputs from Professor Michael Minch from the Utah Valley University, Lisenka Setlacek, actress and peace advisor in Jordan, and Professor Ananda Breed from the University of Lincoln. Michael Minch will first present an academic perspective of the role of arts in peace building. Lisenka Setlacek will then talk about how she has been using art and more specifically theater in peace building projects. Finally, Professor Ananda Breed will share her experience and the results she has seen while implementing art-based peace building projects. We hope you enjoyed their presentations as much as we did. And with no, with no further ado, we invite you to listen to our guest speakers. Violence and nonviolence circulate through every crevice of human life, no matter how small or large the gaps. Violence and peace are a matter of anthropology, sociology, psychology, theology, economics, politics, and near, nearly every human endeavor, from math to music, selling to sculpting, printing to painting, thermodynamics to theater, and polling to poetry. Violence is found in direct and indirect forms, cultural and structural forms, and nonviolence is found in these very same domains a personal and collective life. That is, across human experiences are found the mul multiplicities of information that produces formation. Across the varieties of human practices, we are formed. The array of human forms form us. And because art names a profoundly human set of experiences, forms, practices, and professions, as in to profess or communicate, the arts are locations for violence and nonviolence, or peace. We are informed and we are formed by the arts. The arts make us more violent and less violent, more destructive and more peaceful, depending on the art and the context. In what follows, I will summarize a few aspects of in what respects art is used for peace building. Now, because of the very limited time frame, I will be as sparse and as brief as possible. Rational argument and discourse has a limited effect on motivating people to act. Our wills are moved more so by non-rational, though not necessarily irrational, forces than they are by rationality. To use Hume's binary, our moral actions are produced more by way of the emotions or sentiments than by way of the intellect. Whereas this truth should not lead us to abandon efforts to shape rational discourse and growth in critical thinking, we must recognize that people will be inclined to act so as to build peace as they are moved by forces that appeal to and shape their emotional lives and concomitantly their wills. We are moved through nonlinear means of communication and expressions of moral value. Now, art, of course, names perhaps the most powerful expression of nonlinear means of communication and is certainly used to convey moral value. For the moment, referencing only music, it is not for nothing that Woody Guthrie wrote, This Machine Kills Fascists on his guitar, and Pete Seeger wrote this on his banjo, this machine surrounds hate 
and forces it to surrender. In 2012, a song written by Alana Kaminsky and performed by Aishar Ashtok was banned in Israel on Israeli Defense Forces Radio because the song states that killing can become all too easy, in fact, like a habit. The history of Haiti shows a number of musicians, for example, Mana Charlemagne, the Misa Grayson Band, and Bukman Experience, who have needed to go into hiding because their songs were rightly understood as subversive to authoritarian regimes in Port-au-Prince. Their lyrics and music help mobilize resistance to brutal governments. Acclaimed peace builder John Paul Lederach lists his own exhibits of music moving those in conflict toward peace and reconciliation. He writes, I have found rather consistently that even an artistic five minutes, when it is given space and acknowledged as something far beyond entertainment, accomplishes what most of politics has been unable to attain. It helps us return to our humanity, a transcendent journey that, like the moral imagination, can build a sense that we are, after all, a human community. Lederach tells tales of this truth that stretch from the story of the prophet Elisha aiding the kings Jeroham and Jehoshaphat in the Hebrew Bible, to the formation of the Great League of Nations, often called the Iroquois Confederacy, to the building of peace between the presidents of Burkina Faso and Guinea while their countries were at war in the 1980s, to building the courage of resistance to violence in Sarajevo during the war in the Balkans. Now, incidentally, each of these exhibits of the power of art to move people to peace also involved music. Note that fascist and totalitarian regimes seek to control art, censoring some of it and bending other aspects of it to their own propagandistic or will formation purposes. Some artists are banned and other artists are used. If you ever visit Budapest, outside of the city, you will find a multi-acre reserve of former Soviet art pulled away from the city and other parts of Hungary and now sitting alone because its purposes have been lost to history. Art affects our emotional state and moves us towards feelings and judgments and conclusions and actions. We are changed by art and we use art to change others. Bob Dylan once said, anything worth thinking about is worth singing about. And what is worth thinking about more than peace? Indeed, anything important is worth artistic interrogation and expression. Ending violence through nonviolence is at the top of the list. In short, I would go so far as to say, art can be a form of love. There is something radically giving in the production of art as with love. Just as justice is a form of love, so too is peace since love is the logic and energy and the fountainhead of all virtue. Now, my time is coming to an end, so I can only note important concepts and phenomena related to what I've just said in this final few words. No discussion of art and peace building can ignore the crucial importance of imagination, creativity, and beauty. The roles of space, time, simplicity, complexity, and the openness to transformation that is connected to serendipity. Both art and peace building are also related to healing, freedom, and democracy, and the human vocation 
which is to say our common human calling. What I want to claim here, although I do not have time to demonstrate my claim, is that both peace building and art have intrinsic relationships to these phenomena. This is to say that both peace building and art are being truncated, distorted, betrayed, or cheated to the degree that they do not demonstrate their grounding in these phenomena and do not also produce them. Now, I will end with a brief word about democracy because this is almost certainly the concept among all those I've just listed, which will strike the listener as odd and out of place. Democracy means, of course, people power and names forms of human organization where all people have meaningful, robust, and roughly equal power to determine their collective future. Thus, democracy is essentially a moral as well as a political form. There is a long established acknowledgement of the deep relationship between democracy and peace going back most saliently to Immanuel Kant's 1795 book, Perpetual Peace. But I want to note that art also belongs to all people most fundamentally, and in the end, it too is fundamentally a human expression of our common creative and imaginative powers. Just as we cannot have peace without equality and democratization, so too we cannot have the power of art or even the meaning of art at work among us without equality and democratization. Art produced only for the rich and by experts would be something altogether different than art itself. It would be something like caviar distinct from food. In any case, the shared responsibility and excitement for building a collective future of sustainable and resilient peace depends upon the virtues of people power, imagination, creativity, that are not only intrinsic to peace, but intrinsic to art. Thank you. Okay, so now we should have a sound overview and a first understanding of the role the arts can play in peace building and how the two are linked. You might remember Michael states that we have to use our imagination and creativity, both in arts and in peace building. But what does that concretely look like? Which techniques can be used and how do they work? We have asked these questions to someone who works with arts-based peacebuilding approaches. So come and meet actress and peacebuilder Lisenka and her work in Jordan. Welcome to our theater webinar. My name is Lysenka Zetlacek and I have been working for the Civil Peace Service of GIZ since January 2019 in Al-Karak. The project is commissioned by the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development together with its partner organization Nadi al in Karak, the Creativity Club Al-Karak. And I'm Brendan Wedin. I'm a youth worker at Creativity Club Al-Karak. My name is Zahna. I, I am Wasn. And I am Yan. We are the Zetel Group. Yay! <laughs> Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about why I love the arts as a tool for peace building, as a facilitator. So, I mainly work with foreign theater. Foreign theater was invented by Auguste Boal. He's a Brazilian director and theater activist, and he established the method of theater of the oppressed in the 1970s. Um, and he has different tools uh, for social change, and one of them is forum theatre. In forum theatre, I let the students, which are mainly youth, males and females, between the age of 13 to 
22, sometimes also 30, some older ones. I think it's actually for, for any kind of age group, this is a fantastic tool. Maybe not under 10, but everything over that, uh, it, it usually works quite well because the method is actually addressing emotions and concrete actions. And this is why I love it. I, I really love it. It's a great tool because I think in conflict transformation, just talking doesn't always help because you need to consider all the underlying issues, the, the emotions, the feelings that are attached to that conflict. And I believe that the arts can actually help to express these emotions. So, um, yeah, theatre is one method, a form of theatre especially. We use it for social change and it's usually done that way that um, I let the students create a scene, a uh, conflict from their community, they bring it on stage and then we do a performance. Um, and the audience has the possibility at the point where the conflict escalates, the audience has the possibility to step in um come on stage actually and this is a great thing not just sit there and say hey yeah i think you should do that or something like that no the audience will be asked actually or will be invited to come on stage and perform what he or she has in mind as an intervention now this is a big challenge of course but it's also a hell lot of fun it's really good fun and you can actually see that Putting words into actions, it's not always so easy. Um, and they, yeah, they then interact with the actors. It's uh, really nice to see. And usually what happens is that the actual theatre play or the discussion about the conflict doesn't actually happen on stage. That's just, yeah, giving some input. But it's actually happening in the audience. And this is so beautiful to see because people start discussing about a certain issue, they start questioning, they start questioning their belief systems, their identity, um, because these are things that people often do not do. I, I took a while to understand, hey, where do I come from? What's my identity? Why do I behave that way in certain situations? Um, what is my belief system behind that? And this is everything fosters, uh, fostered by Forum Theatre, so all these questions you raise up. I furthermore work with uh, creative writing. I use that as a tool for well-being, actually, and I think that peace building has a lot to do with well-being. Um, it's basically very similar, but a different form of expression. So you also need to establish, hey, my identity, your belief system, um, and you come up with experiences from the past. You have to draw back onto memories you had. And then the question also, like, how can you change um, a situation? How can you change an outcome? How can you be creative um, and have a different ending? So I think that storytelling for social change, bringing up the story, forming it in front of an audience or making a little booklet or something, it can really um, yeah, have an impact on society. Um, and furthermore, I've been recently starting, uh, started to work with arts as well, like just use colors, for example, and to question myself, hey, why did I choose that color? Um, what does it do to me? How does it feel to make a beginning on page? How does it actually feel just to have a blank page there and do anything I want without having it to look beautiful in the end and just to reflect upon myself. Why did I do which step, when and where? So yeah, these are, these are some methods used for conflict transformation. Um, I think conflict transformation has a lot to do with self-reflection, um, uh, understanding the relationship to each other that you have to other people and understanding where you stand as a society and what changes would you like to see. So for me, at least, the arts has really a great chance to do that. Um, of course, it has limitations. I 
would be very careful sometimes in society where many people have been traumatized. Um, it's a little bit difficult for people to repeat that story, come up with a story of, of the injustice they have seen or observed or self-experienced. So you need to do a lot of research before you start your project. It's, it's really crucial, I think, to the success of the, uh, of the project. Um, that you do your research, you figure out where does this society stand, what has happened to that society, what might have happened to certain groups of that society or to individuals. Um, for me as a facilitator, this is the first thing I do. I, I usually try just to observe. I try to look at certain behavior, certain actions, and this is the great thing about being an actor myself. Um, I have actually learned to observe people very well because stepping into different characters has a lot to do with looking at people and seeing how is their body posture, for example. What's their tone of voice? How do they speak? Um, it tells me already a lot about a human being. Um, how does he or she speak in, in various connections and relationships uh, or behave? These are all factors I think the arts really can help to explore in conflict transformation, in peace building. Um, yeah, so I haven't talked about imagination yet. And I think that in peace building, using your imagination for future change is absolutely crucial. You need to come up with hope, hope that change is possible. And I think this is something very, very important and also underestimated in peace building. Um, but for me also as a facilitator, it's uh, difficult sometimes because of course, Hope, change, it will take a very long time. So I, stepping in as the outsider, I should consider not to have too many expectations myself towards the participants, but also not, not to give too many expectations towards the participants. It's a very balanced thing you need to be very sensitive about it. However, again, here the art step in as a, as a wonderful tool to be creative. And be inspired and, and to create these moments of peace. And sometimes that's all what we need. So, yeah, I think... Um, this is why I love the arts as a tool for peace building so much. And normally people love it too once they try. Thank you very much. And yeah, maybe you can join a workshop somewhere in the world using the arts as a tool for well-being, peace building or conflict transformation. Um, I think that would be quite nice to get some self-experience. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay, so Arts can create moments of peace, Lysenka says, and sometimes that's all that we need. But is that really so, we are wondering? Is there empiric evidence of the power of arts and peace building? What does research say? Now that we're familiar with general linkages between arts and peace building and took a dive into a practitioner's perspective, let's finish our journey with an applied researcher's perspective. Professor Ananda Breed will now share with us her experience on the impact of arts in peace building. 
Hi, my name is Ananda Breed. I'm a professor of theater at the University of Lincoln, and I'm also the principal investigator lead researcher of a project entitled Mobile Arts for Peace, Informing the National Curriculum and Youth Policy for Peacebuilding in Kyrgyzstan, Rwanda, Indonesia, and Nepal. In my talk, I'm going to pick up on some of the points that were made by the other two presenters, Michael and Lazinka, in terms of themes that they mentioned, including space, well being, and communication. I'm responding as both a scholar and a practitioner of applied performance. In terms of framing arts and peace building, Michael remarked on the position between violence and nonviolence, between information and formation. In this way, arts and peace building is situated within a continuum. Also, it occupies a space, potentially a physical space, which is external, and an emotional space, which is internal. And in this way, I'll be exploring the idea of space in relationship to conflict transformation. Both Michael and Lazinka commented on the moral or ethical positioning of arts for peace building, the need for sensitivity when working within particular contexts, particularly in post-conflict contexts. Additionally, the possibility for art to transform and to communicate towards building humanism, encompassing the other, and the ability to contain and negotiate complex narratives, histories, and memories through imagination and play. I want to relate some of these themes to my own research and practice particularly to the use of arts-based methods for peace building in Rwanda, focusing on art to transform in relation to space, art to heal in relation to well-being, and the ability of art to communicate, particularly in relationship to structural violence and trying to uh, address um, the continuum of violence. In terms of art for transformation, I began my research in Rwanda in 2004 during the time of the Gachacha trials. Gachacha in Kenya Rwanda means justice in the grass. And Gachacha was mandated by law for all communities to come together once a week from 2004 to 2012 to hear and to testify in relationship to the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994. During this time, I was researching the use of arts for peace building, particularly grassroots associations who are using arts-based methods, including music, dance, drama, to enable a kind of third space for perpetrators, survivors, and community members to come together in the wake of genocide, um, to enable one another to be able to sit in the grass with each other. Um, and in many ways, this was tried to, trying to address um, healing, to try to address how one can sit together um, week by week and not have that be a completely re-traumatizing experience. Many of these grassroots associations testified that perpetrators and survivors came together because they were able to see that they had shared suffering. In Kinyarwanda, this term is known as kabeberira. And this shared suffering enabled them to think to feel, to search for and imagine how this space could be used to transform their relationships. Many of these grassroots associations were formed by individuals who hadn't had any kind of art training 
prior to developing the arts-based associations. And uh, if I can just give you one particular example of this, I was observing the work of a grassroots association one day and during a break after they had been singing and dancing together. Um, I sat next to one of the members of the company and she had a child who was suckling her breast. And she was telling me that when she does art uh, in this association, that she forgets um, a lot of the events during the genocide and her body elevates as well. Um, she's given energy uh, and lightness. And she motioned to the other grassroots association member who was sitting next to her. And she said, when I sing, when I dance in this association, I forget that my brother here killed my five children. Now, to me, that was a powerful statement in terms of the ability of arts to transform space, to transform an inner landscape, um, but also to transform relations and outer landscapes or environments as well, to create a conducive space for peace building. In terms of arts for healing or art and well being, I'm currently leading a project in Rwanda entitled Mobile Arts for Peace at Home Online Psychosocial Support Through the Arts in Rwanda. This project is aiming to bring together mental health service users and mental health providers through online platforms such as Zoom during the time of the pandemic. And what we found within this project is that by developing a series of online workshops over the span of five months, that digital platforms can also create a space for arts-based methods to be used to enable deep listening, to enable trust building, to enable a space for individuals to share their issues and problems, but also to provide a space to find solutions. Numerous participants have stated that the project allowed them a space to connect, a space for them to laugh, to find joy. And I, I think that uh, as Michael had noted that we can't underestimate the power of arts to enable a space for love, for joy, for giving and receiving. And that through that giving and receiving that there is a transformation. And to note the importance of that communal space for healing, particularly in Rwanda. In terms of the ability for art to communicate, likewise, I'd make reference to the project Mobile Arts for Peace at Home, um, but also another project that I'm leading, Mobile Arts for Peace informing the national curriculum and youth policy for peace building in Kyrgyzstan, Rwanda, Indonesia, and Nepal. In this project, young people are using arts-based methods to communicate their needs and issues with policymakers. As Lazinka had noted, um, forum theater and other methods enable a platform for people to feel that they can express themselves in their mother tongue through embodied knowledge, through indigenous methods so that they feel in a position of power to express, but also in a form in which hopefully 
people can hear them. And the beauty of art space methods is that it can open a space for young people to be able to advocate for their rights um, in their own way. And in a way that often you can't find words for. So it needs to be embodied through dance. It needs to be embodied through a drawing. It needs to be embodied through a poem. And really it's our duty to find ways in which we can listen better, as well as we can help to develop these tools for expression to enable peaceful societies. So we hope that this webinar on how the arts can be used in the context of conflict transformation has, this, has been just as enriching and interesting for you as it was for us. A common point addressed by all our guest panelists we take away is that art, being music, theater, dancing, or any other expression, art opens a space for emotions to be explored and to be expressed, which is, which is of the utmost importance when dealing with conflict and looking for mechanisms to build peace. So maybe this introduction to the topic has made you curious to explore the potential of arts for peace building yourself. In this case, we invite you to check out our website and YouTube channel where you will find more practical material, which Lisenka shared for us in Jordan, explaining you how to use forum theater in practice. We thank Michael, Lisenka, and Ananda for their wonderful contributions to this webinar, and we thank you for watching. Take care. And be creative. Bye. <laughs>